I completely messed up the first thing I was asked to do, which was The Dark Knight Rises. I remember it pretty well. It went dung, gaduka, dung, dung, like my Jamaican guy. It was three, four, one, mute. He heard the title and said that would work really well for Grace Jones. So Mac is playing guitar, Trevor's playing keyboard, I'm playing bass and rhythm. You know, the veins are coming out on your forehead. Try that. So she did that and it worked really well. There is that thing about contracts. A good contract is one where neither party is happy. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we looped a section of the drums where the guitar player had gone off to have a pee. We, we'd argue a lot. We argued a lot. I haven't... Pass. And with Hans, when I met him, I made a jokingly disparaging remark about something. I can't really go, oh, that's amazing, because I don't know what I'm hearing. I need to hear it a few times. And the three of us spontaneously burst into floods of tears. It was the weirdest, weirdest moment, because it sounded so great and had taken so long to get to this point. And she sang it. It was just amazing. That's Stephen Lipson, and he's worked with some amazing people in his career. Started off with Sniff and the Tears, built his own studio. He's worked with Annie Lennox, some great stories uh, about her. Trevor Horn, of course, um, on Propaganda, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Um, he's worked with Grace Jones, um, and his career didn't sort of end in that period, because he now works in films with Hans Zimmer. So, Stick with this interview. It's an hour long, but there's some really fascinating anecdotes, particularly when we come towards the end. So here he is, Stephen Lipson. So Stephen Lipson, Steve Lipson, welcome. Um, obviously, later on, I'm going to talk about, you know, some of these most amazing tracks um, that you've worked on and also your film work. But I want to start really about your family life and what sort of cultural background you were brought up in as a young child. Was it, did you have one at all? A childhood? No, we had a childhood, but whether your parents were very culturally aware or they gave No, you not really. Middle, sort of middle-class Jewish family in North London. Uh, very stereotypical. Uh, uh, Music was not a thing. My dad had a, I think he had a trad jazz record that he listened to. One. <laughs> one trad jazz record. And, and I seem to remember things like uh, Gigi, The King and I, uh, these funny musicals I seem to remember, but of, of no import at all, really. Um, but my brother, at about the age of 13 or 14, decided he was going to be a drummer. And and uh, he was always into music. And he's five years older than me. So I, I sort of grabbed onto his uh, shirt tails, as it were, and, and got, got dragged along learning to drum. And then at the age of eight, uh, I, I don't know, quite, I think on holiday, somewhere my parents bought me a, a five you know five pound acoustic guitar or something i mean they're quite was... brave when they when they you know i presume they bought a drum kit for your brother i don't they... know how he got a drum kit but he used to play in his bedroom and took much to my mother's dismay of course uh, and uh, uh, the, the end result being he moved out of home as soon as he could uh 16 or 17 he'd gone so what attracted you to the guitar? What was what was the reason that you wanted to play a guitar? I haven't got a clue. Uh, maybe because that was the thing. M maybe uh, I I know the first record I learnt on the guitar was "You Really Got Me" by the Kinks, and and uh, the only way I could play it was with a kitchen knife. I I made indentations on the at the top of the fretboard so I knew where to play the one string you know it was rubbish really and then my cousin who was much the same age as me he got a drum kit as well he lived in Kensington which became my my sort of go-to place uh and I'd take my 
acoustic guitar along. And I seem to remember buying a pickup and wiring it to a gramophone so I could hear it. Uh, it was hokey beyond belief. That. We're a similar generation, and I and I remember, and I was brought up in Chelmsford, which is you know northeast of London, and I remember like at school how much of an importance music was as a as a young kid. You know what I mean? It meant everything, and that you were you know you were fans of certain people, and it just seemed something so important at that young age um was that also part of the reason that you would eventually move into a career in music that it had some massive importance to you as a child music was really important it was part of our psyche it was part of our uh, my growing up years uh is that why i went into music i do you know i didn't go into music what all that happened uh was I ended up in a bedroom band, if that means anything to you. We just played in the bedroom with headphones and a drum box, one of those very primitive Roland drum box. Could it have been a CR-78 or something? You know, a really ancient, the very first drum box, basically. And um, uh, I, at the age of 13 or 14, I got a Revox. So it was just a sort of inquiring mind. Uh, so I, I never went into music. I was just playing. And then uh, I got better at playing and our little bedroom band got really good. And then I started doing sessions for a friend who had a jingles company. And that uh, turned into uh me saying to him oh in the meantime my bedroom band got offered a record deal which we blew obviously how did uh, you blow it by being greedy by oh. just wanting more and and the offer we received was so amazing uh but we wanted more <laughs> stupid stupid behavior uh uh and this so anyway my jingles friend I said to him one day, I wish I could figure how all this gear works because my guitar sounds terrible. And if I knew how all the gear worked, I could make it sound great. And he said, well, it's funny you should say that because I've just bought a building and um, maybe you can build a studio for me, which is the strangest thing for someone to say. Uh, and we, we came up with a, a idea of a deal which was he would give me a pot of money and exactly one year and I had to build a studio and get it working within in that time frame. And I presume you knew nothing about building a studio at that point? Le less than nothing. I knew nothing about any of it. I knew how Revox worked and I knew how to play the guitar, not particularly well to this day. And... Um, so in that year, I had 15, one, five thousand pounds to build a studio and feed myself because by that time I'd left home. Uh, and I had to leave my job. So I, anyway, I did it somehow. Yeah. How did you do it though? Did you find, you know, did you have some form of mentor or find anybody no, that you I had anything? nothing, absolutely nothing. I didn't know anyone. So what did I do? I found cheap gear. I found uh, secondhand dealers and basically bought rubbish gear and, and then wired it. And the way I wired it was so bad but I didn't know any better. I bought the cheapest cable because I thought all oh, cable was cable, that, that will do, and concreted it in to the floor instead of ducting and uh, no acoustics and rubbish speakers and a multi-track, 16 track that didn't work properly and a console that didn't do anything and a couple of bits of outboard gear and a few, my, I mean, literally hopeless and had to do a session one year later. With whom? Uh, it was Jingle. 
hover over from Dover with sea speed, since you ask. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a, yeah, well, I'll never forget that. It was like, <laughs> it was like a five-piece band and uh, a three-hour session, my first session. And, and I'd sort of figured enough to be able to hit record and plug microphones in. And uh, anyway, it, I got through it, and it was uphill from then. <laughs> and, um, and, and ironically, I, I don't know what happened, but uh, the studio started doing well. It do, did well enough for us to be able to lease some equipment. And oh, then wow. we got a better tape machine and a better console and, and another, con you know, on and on. It did really well. It shows you how, you know, when you can take those opportunities that they can turn into something immense. So I want to go one step back and then come back to this. But one thing I remember from my teenage years was the representation of what pop stars sometimes meant. I'm of the era where I was a teenager in the early 70s. And for me, David Bowie was everything. He represented the other, the outsider. He represented me getting away from my parents yeah. into a world I wanted to be, where I wanted to be, which was sort of David Bowie's world. Did did you have that with the Kinks or with any band where it represented something more than just the music? No. Uh, I, and I realised, looking back, it was never really about the artist. It was about the record. So, so uh, on occasion, when I, I've had conversations with people about who's your favorite artist or whatever, I, I, on occasion I've, I've thought, well, actually, I don't really have a favorite artist. I have favorite records. And maybe as a, as a kid, it was that. Having said that, I used to go to loads of gigs. I went to this school in the middle of London and uh, boarding, I was boarding. And every, it, it, it doesn't matter how it happened, but every night during the week, uh, I'd sneak out and go to the Marquee Club, well, as often as possible, and saw all sorts of bands there from, from 13 onwards, which was extraordinary. And then at the weekends, we go to the Lyceum uh, for all nighters. And the Roundhouse, I think it was called Implosion. Uh, so it was gigs all the time. And then when not at gigs or not at school, I'd be playing in my bedroom band. So it was sort of all consuming, but not, not, not in a, uh, it, it didn't seem like a career. It, it wasn't that. It was just, I loved it. I loved the music. I loved the, the records, the the people that I, I was involved with. To this day, actually, I, I find people in, in music f more, I, I'm more in sync with them than people who, who aren't, I suppose. I don't, I don't know why or how, but it seems to be the case. Conversation's easier. <laughs> 